This video will give you an introduction to plasmid vectors, the main features of them, and how we can use them to express proteins in cells. Now, plasmid vectors are typically autonomously replicating, which means that they will copy themselves once they are inside of a cell. They have traits such as their ability to be selected, such that they are maintained within a cell, and they often have appropriate sites for insertion of specific genes to which we can then either copy or get expressed. Now, when we're working with plasmid vectors, we talk about subcloning. When we're talking about subcloning, we mean the insertion of a section of DNA into the vector. Typically, we work with cDNA. What we do is to cut the cDNA and the vector and insert them together. We call it cutting and sticking. The place to which this gene is inserted is put into the multiple cloning site of our vector. Now a multiple cloning site means that it has a number of locations that can be cut. Each one of these locations can be cut by a specific enzyme called a restriction enzyme. So what we do is to take our circular piece of DNA, shown here, cut it such that it becomes linear with a specific enzyme. The enzymes that we use are called type 2 restriction enzymes. Now a type 2 restriction enzyme recognizes a specific section of DNA. When it recognizes that specific section of DNA, it will cut it and e leave either a blunt or what we know as a sticky end or overhang that we can then use to stick our two pieces of plasmid and DNA together. When a restriction enzyme such as ECHOR1 cuts, it recognizes a specific sequence of nucleotides, in this case G, A, A, T, T, C. It cuts that, leaving a 5' prime overhang to the DNA. We also have blunt-ended cutters, such as ECHORV. This recognizes the sequence GATATC. It cleaves that, leaving a blunt end. There is no overhang in this occasion. And then finally, we have enzymes such as PST1. This one recognizes the restriction site CTGCAG, and it cleaves us to leave a 3' prime overhang. So restriction enzymes cut DNA. They cut the DNA, leaving either a 5' prime overhang, a blunt end, or a 3' prime overhang. What we then do is to cut our piece of DNA that we're interested in, cut the vector with compatible restriction sites, and then we stick them together. The word we use when we're sticking DNA together is to ligate, and we use an enzyme called DNA ligase to do this. Now DNA ligase finds complementary bits of DNA, either blunt-ended that will join themselves up, or two sticky ends that are complementary to each other, and what it does is to seal the nick or the gap within the DNA. It is primed with ATP, it recognizes that gap, and it performs a covalent reaction bonding those two strands together. So when we're working with DNA and working with plasmids, we take the gene that we're interested in, we cut it, we take the plasmid we're interested in and cut that. They will have ends that are complementary or compatible with each other, and then we stick them together with DNA ligase. Now, when we're cutting and working with our plasmids, we quite often have to use something called phosphatase treatment. When we cut our plasmid, it is initially circular. Once it is cut, it becomes linear, and it may have ends that are compatible. You can see here that the ends T, T, A, A match the ends A, A, TT here. So it is theoretically possible for this vector to ligate and stick back on itself and reform the circle. To stop that from occurring, phosphatase is used, which removes the phosphate group from the end of the DNA, leaving no compatible site for, D for the process to work on and for DNA ligase to find. The only thing that has a compatible end with the phosphate group is our new DNA insert. So when that comes along, the DNA ligase can use this to join up our piece of DNA. So in this way, we can take a strand of DNA, cut a vector, 
take the strand of DNA and cut that, getting ends that match each other, and then ligate them back together using DNA ligase. Now once we've got our vector complete, we're going to imagine now that we've integrated a piece of DNA into the multiple cloning site that I'm circling up here. This creates a new, larger section of circular DNA that we are going to place inside our bacteria cell. And we call that transformation. Transformation is the act of putting the plasmid into the bacterial cell. And we'll have another video on transformation at a later date. Once that plasmid is inside the cell, we need to select for it. We need to put some pressure on the system so only those bacteria that have taken up our plasmid vector are able to survive. To do that, we're going to use an antibiotic resistance gene. In this case, the gene detoxifies ampicillin. Only the bacteria that have taken up our plasmid have this ampicillin's resistance gene on it and so can survive in the presence of the antibiotic. So the plasmid will be transformed into the bacterial cell. Once it's in there, the bacteria has a new gene, this ampicillin resistance gene. It has got a new phenotype in that it is now resistant to the drug ampicillin and will be able to grow in its presence. So bacteria that have taken up the plasmid are able to grow and multiply. Bacteria that do not have the plasmid are not able to grow. In that way, we can select for only those bacteria that have taken up our plasmid. The next thing we need to do is to work on replicating our plasmid. To do that, every plasmid contains what's known as an origin of replication. The origin of replication is a point at which the plasmid is copied. It is recognized by machinery inside the bacteria that sees this as a site that says, copy me here. So the origin of replication is responsible for copying the plasmid inside the cell. It has to be recognized by the machinery already present within the bacterial cell to get that copying to occur. Now there are many different types of origin of replication. We can have origins of replication that result in high copy numbers of the plasmid. That means there are a large number of copies of the same plasmid inside the cell. We call those relaxed in that, there are a lot, in that the copy number is very high. This means there are a, number, a large number of the gene dosage. We also have low copy number plasmids, where there may be one or two copies of the plasmid per cell. Now, as a general rule, the higher copy number, the slower the cells grow due to a process known as metabolic loading. And metabolic loading occurs because once the bacteria has taken up the plasmid, it has to use some of its energy to copy it. The more copies of the plasmid it has, the more energy it has to use to maintain it, and so the slower it grows. Low copy number plasmids do not need as much energy, and so the cell has more energy able to copy and grow itself. We find that low copy number plasmids are useful for gene expression work. We want the cells to be able to grow and get to a high biomass to make our protein of interest. So we lose low copy numbers when we're expressing proteins. When we're cloning DNA, we're interested in the DNA itself. And so cloning vectors will often be high copy number in that we have large numbers of the plasmid inside the cell. In this instance, it's the DNA that we're interested in. So different vectors have different origins of replication. The origin of replication is responsible for copying that plasmid inside of the cell. The higher the copy number, the more the metabolic load and the more energy it's needed for the cell to copy itself. So let's have a quick overview of our bacterial expression vector. Our bacterial expression vector will have a number of key features. Here is an example of one called Pet Blue. It will have on it a promoter. This promoter is responsible for making mRNA from our gene of interest. I'll have a separate video later on showing you how the promoters work. We'll have a LACZ gene. We use this LACZ gene here in order to select for those genes that have taken up our gene of interest. It's going to be inserted in this location here, and when we do that, we break that LACZ gene in half, stopping this enzyme from working. And again, we'll have a separate video later on blue-white screening and the use of the LACZ gene. 
we have a multiple cloning site. The multiple cloning site is made up of restriction sites for each of the different restriction enzymes. We use this to cut the plasmid open to give us a location to insert our piece of DNA. Sometimes we'll find an F1 origin of replication. This is helpful for DNA sequencing as it gives us a handy site to make single-stranded DNA and it can also be used to package this vector inside a bacteriophage if we're interested in doing that. We will have an antibiotic resistance gene. This is to select for that plasmid so only those bacterial cells that have taken up our plasmid are able to grow and replicate. And finally we'll have an origin of replication. The origin of replication is there to copy that plasmid inside of the cell. We will have a low copy number if we are interested in gene expression and a high copy number if we're interested in DNA cloning. Finally, for eukaryotic expression, and to quickly show you the type of features you might see on a vector there, I'm going to show you a, p a piece of DNA called a PCDNA 3.1 vector. Now in this case, many of the same features are present. We have a multiple cloning site at the top. This is used to cut the plasmid open and give a site for the insertion of our gene. We have a promoter. This promoter, in this case, is a mammalian virus the cyclomegavirus. It will cause a large amount of transcription to occur and produce a large amount of mRNA. For every promoter on a, bacteria, on a mammalian expression vector, we have a poly A tail. This poly A tail is needed such that we will get correct mRNA which will be expressed inside of our mammalian cells. Again, we can have an F1 origin of replication so that we can copy and make single-stranded DNA. We have ampicillin resistance so that we can work with this plasmid in bacterial cells. We tend to do our molecular biology in bacterial cells because it's somewhat easier. And we have this neomycin gene here, which I'll have a video again later, for selection in mammalian cells. The idea is the same. Any cell that has taken up this plasmid we need to select for. And neomycin produces a gene that confers resistance to the drug G418. Again, we also have a bacterial origin of replication. Now this bacterial selection gene and bacterial origin of replication occur here because working in bacteria and doing our molecular biology in bacteria is easier than doing it in mammalian cells. So we often create our plasmids first in bacteria and then transform them into mammalian cells.